it's actually a very useful tool that allows you to set up templates within 3D Max. So each and every time you open Max, it'll default to a certain kind of layout. What does this mean? Well, let's just quickly show you. If I hit reset right now on 3D Max, you're going to notice that nothing really changes. This is effectively my default Max layout. If I want to change that, for instance, let's go into the perspective view and hit Alt W to full screen this view. I'm now going to do what I call a file save as, and we're going to set this up as max start. I'm going to go over here and hit save, and voila, we just created a template file. Anything by default that's called max start and that lives in documents, 3ds max scenes, will become your new template. So I'm going to go up here and hit reset. And notice what happened. This is now my default layout. So let's actually start going over some things that are very useful for a production pipeline. So if you're working at a AAA studio, things that an art director or art lead might ask of you. So I'm going to go into this plus tab right here, go to configure viewports. And it's already defaulted to the tab I want to go to, statistics. I want to visualize my poly count, my triangle count, my vertex count. Because I'm not animating, I really don't care about the frames per second right now. So I'm just going to uncheck that, and I'm going to check total plus selection. What that means is when I see this dialog for statistics, it's going to show me the total number of polys in my scene. It's also going to show me the polys of an object that I've selected in my scene. Very useful. So now I'm going to go down here to the application, hit display my active view, hit apply, hit OK. And then suddenly I see my polys for the total scene, the tries, and the verts. So those of you who are not familiar with this, I'm just going to quickly go over this. I'm going to drop a couple objects in the scene and watch these totals change. And now I have a cone. And voila. So now in my entire scene, it says that I have 1,464 polys. This uh, cone has 288 polys and 146 verts. The cylinder has 216 polys, 110 verts. And I know this cylinder correlates to this because they have exactly the same naming conventions. And as you can see, the sphere has 906, 60 polys. This is very useful. Because if you ever have a max master scene, meaning I'm creating a modular pipeline, I have hundreds of assets in this one master file. That way, anytime I import it into Unity, I can very quickly update all my modular assets through one master scene. If I have a performance issue, I can very quickly start clicking through to find out the object that has the most polys that might be causing performance issues, and I can then attack that and optimize that to see if that actually increases performance on the end device. In this case, because we're structuring this around Camouflage's pipeline, that would be because we're having performance issues on iOS or Android. So in this case, I'm just going to now delete these objects because I no longer need them. I'm going to go up to each one of these viewports and hit 7 to display the statistics. I am then going to Resave over the max start file. So file save as max start. I'm going to save that. And now this is my new template. So I have consistency now. I have something that I can hand out to all my production artists, my environment leads, and tell them author content in this fashion. And I know I have consistency. What are other things that might be useful in a production pipeline? Well, for Unity, at least, it boiled down to unit setup. So this appears to already be set up in a decent manner with the exception of the system units. So Unity uses a system units of meters. So I'd want to change the system units in 3D Max to be meters as well. So I'm just going to set that to meters, hit OK. And I'm just going to leave the display unit scale because centimeters is just fine. This affects how your tools work. So because this is set to centimeters, when I'm actually doing a chamfer, it's going to be chamfering based off centimeter. If you set this to meters, that's almost like too little granularity. Like when you end up at applying a chamfer, it'd be a, me a one meter chamfer to an edge. When you actually need centimeters to get in there to be able to get the fine detail. So with that said, I'm going to hit OK. 
And then I'm also going to go up to Customize Preferences, and I'm going to change our gamma threshold. So most people I've encountered, at least in the industry, don't actually know what gamma is for. This is specifically uh, updated within uh, Max 2014 to be a default of a gamma 2.2. What that means is they're trying to have you author content in a positive 2.2 fashion. So when it hits a device like PC, Xbox, PlayStation, it'll actually be uh, establishing a linear pipeline. And I don't want to get into too much detail about uh, gamma thresholds, linear pipeline, because it's a very dense topic, and anyone who's actually working on these devices should already be working in this threshold. But what I will do is I'll have a document that I can apply for you, and that's going to have a bunch of information that is very useful. So if I go to my web browser right now, I already have a bunch of tabs that I've handpicked that can help you understand what a linear pipeline is. So if you end up going to Filmic Games by John Habel, he talks about linear space lighting. Uh, this individual actually works for Naughty Dog Game Studios, and he talks about why you implement a gamma threshold, what it actually means. And if you scroll down further, in layman's terms, if you're authoring content in a standard pipeline, meaning this line right here, this is how you see your images on your PC, you haven't changed in your gamma settings, your image may look like this. But unfortunately, when it pushes it to a dev like a PlayStation or uh, your PC, your images might actually come out darker than you would expect. That's why you establish a gamma threshold or a linear pipeline. So what you effectively do is author your content with a positive 2.2 gamma, and then you modify 3D Max and Photoshop so it displays at this level, which is linear, so when you actually file, finally save out your final product and it hits the monitor, it'll actually be in this linear uh, gamma, meaning your content will come out consistently. So what you see on your display will effectively be the end result. That's why you establish a linear pipeline. Unfortunately, if you've done any kind of investigation, linear pipelines only work on consoles and PC right now. And this individual, John, uh, calls this out. It only works on PC, PlayStation 3, 360, or PlayStation 4, Xbox One at this point. And it's not supported by Wii, PlayStation Portable, or iPhone devices. So just realize that if you're working on mobile, you're still going to be working in a standard pipeline. So with that said, I am going to give you a document that has links to digital tutors, how to set up a linear pipeline within 3D Max. Another link from Digital Tutors that shows you linear pipeline within Maya. And then finally, I'm going to give you a couple other gems that I found on 3D Total on uh, John Steen's uh, website about how to set up Photoshop in a gamma space of 2.2, which is very easy. I can show you that very quickly here. I'm just going to scroll down here, open up Photoshop. Now if I go to Edit, Color Settings, and you can see mine's already defaulted to 2.2 because I've been messing around with it a little bit earlier. But by default, it's a dot gain of 20%. Well, if you're authoring content in a linear pipeline, you're going to want to change that going to color settings and then change that to a gamma 2.2, which means when you're authoring your textures, they're going to be brighter than you would expect, but it's going to display appropriately here. And then when you bring into 3D Max or Maya or Modo, because you've set your gamma threshold to 2.2, it's going to look visually correct, but it's going to export the textures brighter than you would expect. So when it hits device, it will render correctly. So once again, like once you set up these parameters, you can hand this to your artist, your environment artist, or just build your own pipeline. So when you're authoring content, it is actually in the correct gamma space. So unfortunately, because Camouflage is working on iOS devices, I actually have to undo what Max is trying to be smart about. I actually have to set this variable to 1 and hit OK. I'm then going to go up here and do File, Save As, Max Start. And effectively, I have this set up for my production pipeline, exporting to Unity, and a standard gamma threshold, which is perfect for my needs. Now. Other things you could do about this is you can create yourself several different templates based off your needs. So for instance, 
I have one in here called Max Start V-Ray 01. I'm just going to hit, go ahead and click on that and see what happens. It's immediately going to change my units from meters to centimeters because at least with uh, V-Ray, I find that working in centimeters is actually more appropriate than working in meters because it's a physically accurate rendering system. Having this denomination for my units seems to have better results in my opinion and I have more control over the, what I'm going to see. So see right here, I already have a temp scene. I have a sphere in here. I have a few lights in here for quickly rendering out a test scene. And then if I go up to my renderer, that opens up, it already defaults to V-Ray. So watch what happens. I hit render. I've already gone through here, customized all my V-Ray settings to have very quick results. So every time it renders, I'm gonna have decent results at a fairly fast pace. And all I have to do is start swapping out these components and voila, I have a render done. So with that said, that's a max start file. I'm going to stop this for right now because you don't need to see me render out this entire thing. And I hope you understand the power of a max start file now. So after this, we're going to be jumping into quad menus and how that helps you speed up your workflow. And all it is is if I hold down control and I right click, you'll see that this quad menu pops up because it's called that because there's four different boxes that you can customize. And I have this currently customized with what I consider the most important modeling tools out there, at least within 3D Max. And we're going to be going over why I use these tools, why you should consider using these tools to speed up your pipeline. So stay tuned, and we're going to be digging into the quad menu. Each and every one of our environment artists and prop artists ends up using if they're a 3D Max user. So I created this, and for one reason, one reason only, to speed up efficiency workflow and predictability. If you don't customize your user interface, you're doing yourself a disservice. Speed up your workflow, customize your tools, make it as easy as possible to get to the functions that you use the most. So with that said, let's go to the perspective view, Alt W, and I'm gonna show you the quad menu I created that you will have access to at the end of this video. So let's go ahead and create a box. I'm just gonna click, drag it out. Zoom out a little bit, right click, and now we're going to hit F4 to go to edge mode. And finally, let's just make sure this is a perfect square. I'm just going to do 5,000 by 5,000 and by 5,000. So now we have a perfect square. So the first thing to know about workflow is reducing the number of steps to do a common function that you end up doing quite a bit. So I'm going to show you the hard way and then I'm going to show you the easy way. So I want to convert this to an edit poly because most of the tools I use are in edit poly mode. So I'm going to go to the modifier list, hit E for edit, edit poly. Then I'm going to go to the edit poly section, right click, collapse all. And now it's an edit poly. Uh, that was about three to four steps just to get to that. Um, is there a faster way? Absolutely. Let's control Z a couple times. Now watch this. Control right click, edit poly, done. That was one left mouse button action. I mean, I can go in and out of this quad menu very quickly, it takes seconds. It, it becomes second nature. So if that doesn't give you a strong enough foundation of why you should be using the quad menu, let's continue on. Let's see if I can convince you otherwise. I wanna use the Swift Loops tool. I wanna add, add edges to this to increase the edge loops. So when I start doing high res modeling, I can actually retain some of the shape. So first thing I'm gonna do, Turbo Smooth. Oh, look at that pretty box. It looks nothing like it anymore. I'm going to turn Isoline Display. And if you look at this, it actually kind of resembles a box because it is at the end of the day. I mean, if we turn this on and off, this edge represents that edge right there. It's just that we have no information associated with it. We don't have enough edges in here to define this. So we're going to go to this drop down. It takes a couple of seconds to load up. I have to go to Edit Poly Mode, go to Swift Loop, click on this edge. Click on that edge, turn on Turbo Smooth, and now I'm actually starting to get some of that information. That's a lot of steps just to add a couple edges. Well, I'm gonna show you a faster way. Let's Control Z that a couple times. Control Z, Control Z. Go to Edit Poly Mode, and I'm gonna show you this toggle right here. What this toggle does is allows me to display all the modifiers that are above a given point. So if I have Turbo Smooth selected and I have about five modifiers above this, It'll only show those modifiers from that point up. So I'm going to turn this on. 
And you can see I, I'm in edit poly mode, but I'm visualizing the turbo smooth. Now I'm going to control, right click, turbo, or swift loop. Hit that edge. And there you go, I have an edge there. I'm going to hit this edge, just to make it a little bit easier to visualize. Now, I'm going to just go through the rest of this object, add edges to this, see if I can't make a rigid box. And there you go, I have a cube. Could it be a little bit tighter? Absolutely. But for this uh, tutorial, I think this is more than enough. I mean, we have close to 7,000 polys right now, and arguably it looks a lot more like a cube than it did at the beginning. So next thing I'm going to show you is the loops tool. This is a very fun tool. If you haven't figured this thing out yet, um, you're going to be in awe at what it actually does. So go to poly mode, control, click on a couple of faces, delete those faces, and oh, we already came across another potential issue. So with Max 2014, they actually turned off backface call by default, which means you're always seeing every one of the faces both front and back. This is decent for starting artists, but if you're actually in a production setting creating game assets, you're going to want to know exactly which direction the faces are going in. So watch this. I click this face, and you might be thinking, okay, well, that has interior face. Well, that's not the case. Now watch this. Ignore back facing. None of these faces actually exist. It's just doing a double-sided display. How do I turn this off? Well, you right-click, Object Properties, Backface Call, check that box, hit OK, and now you're seeing the actual faces of your object, and there's actually nothing on the inside of this. Once again, that was about a four-step process to get to that point, when you could have just Control, right-click, turn on the toggle. Control, right-click, Backface Call, toggle, and you're done. Now you see exactly what you need to. What else can I show you? Well, let's go to border, click this edge. I'm going to do uh, scale and shift. And now check out this. We're going to go to loops tools, and here we go. So this right here, this circle button, is the only button or function I found in Max that does this. If you want to create the same uh, action, you're going to have to create a cylinder, you're going to have to snap to the surface of your box, you're then going to have to snap a bunch of verts to the cylinder to create a circular shape. When you could have just hit the circle, and now you effectively have a perfect circle in this location. And it's not vert dependent. I mean, I can have as many verts or edges in this as, po as I possibly want. Say I have a high-res box. Grab this border. Hit circle again. There you go. You might get some uh, slight distortion on here, but that's super mi minor considering what it actually does for you. Now watch this. I'm going to extrude this out. Hold down shift, pull. I'm going to scale this now. Pull it back a little bit. Scale that down. Hold down shift again. Scale that down. I can do this all day. Now what about this? This hole. I have a hole here. Well, I could go down here and cap it, or I can just control, right click, cap. And now I could go to my poly mode, grab that. I could go find uh, inset, well, or I could go control, right click, inset. It's all about efficiency. And the fewer times you actually have to go over to your modifier stack, you're going to be saving yourself seconds. And that adds up to minutes and hours by the end of a project. So think about that next time you're modeling. Think about speed, efficiency, and how you can do your job faster. Um, let's just go ahead and go to high poly mode. Let's see if I can't make this feel a little bit more like a hammer. I don't think I was initially going for a hammer, but uh, let's just try to make it feel like one. There you go. I have a very blunt hammer. It doesn't really have a surface on it right now or a hammering face, but let's just grab some of these faces. No, oh, that, that's happening because ignore back face is still on. So let's go top down, grab all these faces, pull them out. And there you go. We have at least some kind of surface you could be hammering with. Does it look great? Absolutely not. But is it fast? Is it efficient? Absolutely. There's no way you can deny that that's a lot faster than digging into the modifier stack each and every time. So speed up your workflow, create a quad menu, customize it as you see fit. Find the best tools you possibly can to create the tools that you need. So if you're in animation, customize your quad menu for animation. If you're doing rendering, customize it for rendering. And you might be asking yourself, well, how am I supposed to customize it without actually knowing how? Well, let's go into that. So all you have to do is go customize, customize user interface. Takes a couple seconds to load up. And then all you have to do from here is go to your quads tab, 
open up this drop down right here. And because my quad modeling tool, I just overwrote the modeling, the default at least. So every time I hit control, right mouse, right mouse button, it gives me my quad menu. So for instance, when I control right, right here, this bottom right corner is effectively this quad menu. This top right corner is this quad menu. Well, how do I add functions to it? It's very simple. Let's just scroll down, see if I can't find something that might be useful. Maybe pyramid. Maybe that's just the tool I needed. All you do is click, drag it in there, and let's just try this out. Control right click, and now I can create a pyramid on the fly. It's as simple as that. What happens if I need, let's see, what else? Quadrify. I already have it in here, but let's go ahead and drag the Quadrify in here. And now every time I control right click, I have Quadrify built in my quad menu. It's as simple as that. There's no reason you shouldn't be customizing this because it's very useful. Build it into your workflow, speed up your production. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for generalists that are good in a lot of different areas that specialize in one thing. In this case, maybe it's modeling that actually have a fast, efficient workflow. I don't need a person that takes five days to model a cube when I have another person that can do it in a day. So think about that. Speed up your workflow, use the quad menu. The next lesson we're going to be going over is plugins. Controversial to some, but extremely useful if you know how to find the right scripts, find the right programs or authoring tools to be able to speed up your workflow. Once again, look for tools, customize your user interface, and customize your templates. Go to your Mac Start, set that up. And things that ends up wasting my time is adding edge loops to an objects to retain their shape when I'm doing high poly modeling. So I think most people that end up doing hard surface modeling of any kind actually understand the principle of adding edge loops, supporting edges to retain a high poly object shape. Well, you don't need to do that anymore. If you just download a plugin, pay $50 roughly to a man named Marius, you can actually purchase Turbo Smooth Pro. This is an amazing tool. I haven't seen any other tool like this. And effectively what it does is allows you to apply material IDs and edge creasing to actually control how Turbo Smooth manipulates the mesh. It's a huge time saver. I, I can't stress this enough. So spend the time, watch a couple of these videos and see if this can convince you, or I at least I can convince you that this is a tool worth buying. So with that said, I'm just gonna quickly show you a few things you can do with this tool. Here we are in Max. I'm gonna to go to full screen mode, go to top down, go to my create tab, and then I'm just gonna quickly create a line right here. And I'm gonna convert this spline to, you guessed it, a poly. There we go. Look at that, beautiful already. Hit G, turn off grid. And then from here, I'm gonna be using my quad menu that I've already showed you in previous uh, episodes. So with that, I'm gonna right click, convert to poly. Go to my poly mode, go to polygon, and I'm gonna delete some faces. Get just setting this up for Turbo Smooth Pro. I'm gonna turn off back face cold just so it's a little bit easier for me to see what's going on. There we go. And now if I go to my modifier stack, hit T for turbo, I'm just gonna go ahead and apply Turbo Smooth Pro. And if I go up in my Turbo Smooth Pro, I have iterations just like I do in Turbo Smooth. Crank that up. I have isolation display, just like I do in the original. But the big difference here is under geometry, there's creasing. So under vertex weight, edge weighting, smoothing groups, watch what happens when I hit smoothing groups. It allows me to now access this creasing mechanism. Effectively, what this says is, based off your material IDs, start smoothing this object based off that information. And what it does is, once again, increases your tension. To better, better illustrate this, I'm gonna turn on Visualize, which is built into Marius's tool, and watch what happens. I'm gonna start pulling this up, and suddenly using Vertex Color, he's actually showing you where all this tension is being applied, and hence, it retains its form. This is amazing. Like, if I wanted to do this with the basic Turbo Smooth, I'd actually have to go through here, add a bunch of supporting edges to get the same effect. This is huge. If any of you have done hard surface modeling using edge loops, you'll realize the benefit of this tool immediately. 
To uh, better show off what this can do, I'm just going to go ahead and throw a basic uh, shader here. All it really has is a, let's see if I can pull this over a little bit further, a specular component to it, so you can see highlights a little bit better. I'm going to assign it to my object, pull this back off screen, and let's go ahead and add a few more edges to this object. So if I go down my stack, edit poly, do uh, my visualize toggle, this visualizes all the modifiers above the layer I've selected. And now I'm just going to add a swift loop. Go to edge mode. The edge is uh, immediately selected, and now I'm going to extrude this edge. And there we go. So out of the gate, it doesn't look too impressive. I mean, you look at that. I, I think I probably want like a hard edge within here. How can I do that with Turbo Smooth Pro? Well, if I go to edge mode, double click this edge, it just grabbed that loop. It's a little hard to visualize, but trust me, it's grabbed it. And now if I go down to this section that's called waiting, watch what happens when I increase this value. Voila. I've effectively just add tension to this one edge. Now tell me, how long would that have taken you to use Mesh Smooth or Turbo Smooth? A considerable amount of time. And look at my poly count. Turn off Turbo Smooth. I have 196 polys here, just to define that information. That, that's amazing. Now watch this. I'm going to clone this over. How many polys do you think I'm going to have after I remove this and do the typical Turbo Smooth? Well, let's find out. Apply Turbo Smooth. Turn up my iterations. Turn on Isolating Display. Already can tell that I don't have much going on here. I lost all my form. So I'm going to quickly go to Edge Mode. Make sure I'm on the poly section. Turn on Swift Loop, and now I'm just going to start going through here, adding edge loops to make all this a little bit more rigid so I can define the shape better. All right, almost done here. Bear with me. I know this is taking a little bit longer, but I have to do this if I'm going to give you a one-to-one -one representation of how much time I'm actually saving here. There we go. Let's turn on Turbo Smooth Pro, and I have something pretty close. I mean, you can even see like this is a bit soft in comparison to that. So maybe I'm going to go back in here, add a few more edges to kind of tighten this up a little bit. Uh, that's that's close. It's not exact, but it's close enough. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but that was a lot of clicks. That took me quite a bit of time to get to this point. Let's go ahead and turn off my Turbo Smooth. <laughs> And I mean, look at that. This is 196 polys. This is 644. If you have to do that for a simple shape like this, just imagine creating an entire object in that fashion. We're talking about hundreds of man hours, hundreds of man hours being saved by just simply converting to Turbo Smooth Pro. Pay the $50, get the plugin, use it. Now I'm going to show you some models that I've created in a very quick fashion just kind of further illustrate how useful this tool is and how by creating content in this way, which is non-destructive, can save you a lot of time. So here we go. We have two different models. Actually, they're exactly the same model. The only difference is, is this is the basic Turbo Smooth. Let's turn this off. You can see all the supporting edges in here I've had to add to create this shape. And then we go to this object. Exactly the same modifier stack. The only difference is I don't have the supporting edges and I'm using Turbo Smooth Pro. So this is extremely flexible. I mean, watch this. I can take this object, tweak a few parameters of my SSD modifier or my FFD modifier, and I can get all this variation in shape and form that if I wasn't using this tool or if I wasn't using a non-destructive pipeline, I wouldn't be able to do this. This would take forever. I could go into ZBrush and try to sculpt this, but I'm talking about hours worth of time. Unless, of course, I've built this in 3D Max or Maya, created a height map and alpha, brought into ZBrush, and then projected that and used it as a displacement. I could do the same thing, I suppose, but why do that when I have all this flexibility in my modifier stack to get all these unique shapes? So what else can I show you? Well, I quickly coupled this together, just using some symmetry modifiers, throwing some spheres on top, and yeah, created this ornate shape. Uh, I'm going to just quickly show you how quickly you can take this. I've already set this up for a projection. There we go. And to speed up time, I've actually, uh, I'm suppressing the window, so this, should, this render should be fairly quick. So let's go ahead and hit render. 
it's going to render these components. I want it to continue over at the files and it's baking and it's done. So normally you'd have the window open to see progress to see how well things are going, but for sake of this video, I just want to suppress all that information. And let's see, if I shrink down this window, go to render two, and then let's just go ahead and open this up real fast. Photoshop's loading, and let's look at these textures I've just created. There you go, there's the diffuse map. Let's see the normal, and look at that. I mean, at any point in time, I could go back into 3 Max, change my modifiers, re-rip that information, and I would suddenly have all this variation built into this. It's awesome. Use TurboSmooth Pro. If you're not using it, you're doing yourself a disservice. And I'll show you one more thing. All these assets right here were created using TurboSmooth Pro. I mean, once again, just like look at the textures. I'm going to provide all this content to you. And if this does not convince you the usefulness of this tool and the fact that it saves you time, you're not thinking in a production setting. It's all about saving time, not wasting money and resources, and creating things in a non-destructive format. So with that said, the next video is going to be about text tools and what that is and how that can help you with textile density. The ability to establish textile density through text tools. What's textile density? Well, unfortunately, most schools haven't been teaching this because I can tell you what, I've had a number of interns come into camouflage game studios that don't actually know this convention. So to be able to give you a better foundation, I'm going to go into a totally different realm right now. Most people understand units in association with creating props. So for instance, if I create a Coke can, if I create a shotgun, if I create a car, you're building all these based off a certain size in comparison to probably a character in your world. That's creating a unit of measurement that everyone can kind of consistently draw from. So environment artists are all creating things roughly the same size. Well, textile density is effectively doing that same principle, but with your textures. So for instance, in the game Republic for camouflage, we have established that a 256 represents four feet worth of information. A 512 represents eight feet worth of information. 10, 24, I think you're at the point, 16 feet worth of information. And then finally, a 20, 48, 36 feet worth of information. What does that really mean? Well, what that helps environment artists do is when they author a 512 texture, they know immediately that from top to bottom, left to right, that it needs to represent eight feet worth of information. How is this useful? How is this crucial? Well, let me just show you something very quickly that I've mocked up. So I'm in my 512 texture right now. Here's eight feet. Uh, now suddenly here's a brick texture that I've created. Uh, roughly, if you know how large a brick is, we're effectively just saying a brick in this case is about two inches tall. And if you include grout, this is roughly 45 bricks altogether. That's what I would consider about the correct resolution or number of bricks that should actually encompass the entire length of eight feet. So if I save this, if this is truly to textile density, this should look correct in association to our character Hope. So here we are, here's Hope. And behind her, we have the brick texture. In my opinion, this size of this brick looks correct in association to Hope. Hope is roughly five feet, three inches, give or take a few. And it doesn't look foreign, it doesn't look off. What I mean by off? Well, if I go back to Photoshop and I take this brick texture, transform, and let's just scale this up. Hit enter. And I've aggressively changed this texture. I mean, if I really wanted to ship this, I'd have to clean this up, sharpen this texture up. But for this test, I'm just gonna show you how wrong this looks. So here's eight feet worth of information now. If I save this out, suddenly look what happens. Hope feels like she's a child. I mean, she feels very small in comparison to the world around here. This is why you establish textile density. So if everyone's trying to build eight feet worth of information into a 512 texture, I know I'm gonna have consistency. That's huge. So that's what textile density allows us to do. So I'm gonna go back to Photoshop for the remainder of this. I'm gonna turn off this brick texture. Now that I feel like you have a general idea of what textile density is. And I'm gonna point you to a couple websites. So this first one is Text Tools. Uh, text Tools is a UVW unwrap, like batch of plugins that this uh, person's made. 
And there's a lot of very useful features in here. I mean, a lot of them are just shortcut keys, but the primary tools we're going to be using is right down here, the bottom, what, fourth of this uh, panel. And at the very bottom, it's all these tools that are associated with texel density and how to establish consistent resolution. So if I scroll down a little bit further, we have this first button, and effectively this is normalize. It takes your objects, sub-objects, and makes the resolution consistent. You can see here we have one texture resolution and one's a little bit larger, and then effectively hit normalize, and effectively your shells are all the same size. Um, then we have pick texel density. This is somewhat useful if you're just trying to get a general idea, but we don't use this tool very often simply because it has room for error. Where it's much easier to establish text density if everyone's using the same algorithm or mathematical equation, because effectively at the end of the day, that's effectively what uh, text density is. It's a mathematical equation that helps you figure out what your resolution is. And then finally, assign text density. This is useful if you're batch processing a bunch of objects. You can just uh, say set uh, resolution and then immediately changes the resolution of all your objects to be consistent. It's useful for tiling, tiling textures, textures. It's useful for tiling textures, not so useful for individual textures, meaning hero objects. So if you've authored a gun, has all its unique textures, and you've authored a garbage can, has all its unique textures, you're not going to be wanting to run this set textual resolution because you've already authored your textures. It doesn't make sense. Um, if you're a Maya user, they have this free plugin called Nightshade UV Editor 1.4.1. And once again, texel density is built in. So there are no excuses of why you're not using texel density at this point. Use it. It's going to make your work look consistent. So let's show you a practical example. If I go to Michael's website right here, we have this one image right up here. All these assets at the top look consistent in resolution, at least in my opinion. I mean, it feels like this barrel fits the world around it, with the exception of the ground. The ground feels pixelated. This breaks the immersion of game players. I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now, but this is very important. We stress, I can't stress this enough. Like I have all my environment artists, before they even create any content, understand the principles that you must establish textile density and you must conform to these principles. Number one rule. To kind of show you the difference, I mean, this is a floor that has consistent resolution based off the things around it. You could argue that these bricks are a little bit too large, but when it comes down to resolution, crispness of the textures, this looks consistent. This looks correct to me. So here's another example. This is just like what we were seeing with the normalized tool. This character has consistent resolution from head to toe. This character doesn't. This is not conforming to a specific texel density. That's why you do this, so you can have consistency and it increases quality. So. Let's just show you some practical examples with a few uh, minutes I have left. So I'm going to create a box real fast, turn on wireframe, and the first thing I'm going to do just for ease of use is set this box to 8 feet by 8 feet by 8 feet. There we go. And now I'm going to just go ahead and apply a 512 texture to this because I've already said 8 feet represents 512's worth of information. There we go. And as you can see, immediately, it already looks correct. I mean, because 3D Max, when you create a geometric primitive, it maps everything to the 0 to 1 every face, it looks correct. Well, what happens if I open up text tools now? So here we are. I have 512, and it represents 2.4384 worth of information. You might be asking yourself, where do I get that? Well, because we are working in meters, you have to convert 8 feet into the equivalent of meters. 8 feet actually is 2.4384 meters. That's where that comes from. So, for instance, if I take this object, and I'm just going to break it really fast, I'm going to say this texture I've applied is a 256, even though we know it's a 512. And I'm going to right-click on Set Resolution, and it's going to start calculating. Oh, I have to convert it to a poly first. I'm going to right click, it's going to start calculating. And suddenly I have double the resolution I'm going for because effectively this is not a 256, this is a 512. And I just said apply a resolution of a 256 to this object. Well, if I change this to a 512, it's going to snap right back to the consistent resolution we see here. Very useful. That's why you have text density. I can ensure whether or not I'm working with a 256. 512, 10, 24, 
I can figure out how many times that texture needs a tile or how large my UV shells need to be in, in correspondence to that. Well, what's another example I can give you with a little bit of time I have left? Well, let's just go ahead, unhide the sphere, and here we have a sphere. So this has already been applied with the four different resolutions, and I'm just going to very quickly go through here. This face represents the 512. Apply UVW Unwrap to isolate that. I'm going to set the resolution to 512, run the process. I've just set the resolution for that quadrant. Now I'm going to do Edit Poly, open this up, grab the corresponding faces for my 2048s, UVW Unwrap, and this is important. You have to do this every time. You have to apply this every time to each quadrant. Otherwise, it's not going to work correctly. Right-click, it's going to run, and there we go, consistent resolution. If you do this for every material type you have, you will have consistent resolution. I, I know that's brief. We're going to be talking about textile density in further chapters, but realize that's the reason you have textile density. That's why you want to use text tools or the equivalent. In the next chapter, we're going to be talking about another plugin that's very useful that helps you push content 